We are having another Engineering Tomorrow Lab, and I am so excited about this one. It is all about space. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about space missions. We're going to talk about launch vehicles. We're going to answer all your questions about space. You're going to develop a launch vehicle. We're going to have so much fun. I didn't do this by myself, though. My good buddy, Travis, shout out to you. Travis helped me develop this. And man, we have some awesome interns. Lauren did a great job. And Katie, they absolutely killed this in this lab. So we hope you have a lot of fun. Just to talk a little bit about the lab and what we're doing. We're going to start talking about space flight history because, hey, if you don't know where we started, we don't know where we're going. We'll talk a little about launch vehicles and essentially launch vehicles are the rockets that get us into space payloads and all the different missions you can perform in space. We're going to learn how we travel from the Earth to the moon, to the stars and beyond. In addition, you're going to have the ability to navigate a SpaceX capsule to maneuver and rendezvous and dock with the International Space Station and put some astronauts onto the space station. Isn't that exciting? It's a it's a cool like video game. We're going to have so much fun with this. But first, what type of engineers do you think complete missions in space? What type of engineers complete missions in space? Well, if you said it's a combination of astronautical engineering, they perform the missions in space. That's what aerospace encompasses, but it also encompasses aeronautical engineering. Those are the engineers that, hey, if you ever flown on a plane, they operate planes within our atmosphere. So Aeronautical engineering is everything that is within our atmosphere. Astronautical engineering is everything that is beyond our atmosphere. Today, we're going to focus on astronautical engineering and we're going to have a lot of fun. But first, let me tell you a little bit about how I jumped into the STEM field. This is my journey. I absolutely love RC cars. You may have seen this in a previous video. I like to race them up and down the street. I like to change out the gears, but I'm also really into anything space. Yeah, I have TOEs on there. TOEs is not feet, but it is theories of everything. Like, remember when Matthew McConaughey was an interstellar and he traveled through space and time? He traversed space and time in order to save his family. I just thought that was crazy cool. I debated my physics teachers on Big Bang Theory, all of that great jazz, but I didn't go to the best school in the world. I say the best technology we had at my school was a typewriter. Great people, but it was a challenge. So I self wrote in a community college. And when I was there, my counselor said, hey, Milton, you're really kicking butt. But what do you want to do with your life? So we mixed all that stuff about RC cars and all those things about space. And we landed on aerospace. And luckily for me, he knew some people that were interview me at NASA. And the rest was absolutely history. I've been loving it ever since. I transferred to Purdue West Lafayette, where I got a bachelor's in aerospace and aeronautical engineering. And bam, that is me as an intern a long time ago. But what hasn't changed is we're going to use the same engineering design process that we use on satellites and rockets to develop your own rocket vehicle today. So I want to talk a little bit about what I do for a living. My main project is helping to address satellites that have died. Do you know what happens to a satellite when it dies? Well, you're looking at top right image. Sometimes it just becomes like space traffic and space junk. And sometimes satellites just collide and run into each other. And sometimes a satellite, you know, it may run out of fuel, so it can't keep itself propelled. So eventually gravity starts pulling it down. And as it pulls it down, it's being heated and ablated until it burns up and hopefully does not hit the ground, right? OSAN 1 stands for On Orbit Servicing Assembly and Manufacturing, mission number one. And the first thing that we're going to do with OSAN 1 is rendezvous and dock with the Landsat 7 satellite. That's a satellite that's been working, but it's starting to degrade. So we're going to grab onto it with a seven degree of freedom robot arm. We're going to reel it in, pull it in. We're going to take all our different tools that we have on it. Then we're going to actually cut it open and you'll see in a minute, we'll start cutting open that satellite and then we're going to refuel it. After we cut open that thermal blanket, then we're going to take the robotic arm and its tool and actually refuel that Landsat 7 mission so we can place it back into its original orbit and it can keep functioning almost as if it had never died. Hey, we're bringing satellites back to life. That's what OSAN 1 is all about. Let me also talk about some different technology that I've helped develop. I've helped develop a LIDAR. A LIDAR is really cool because 
similar to cars that have sonar and they, they have self-driving, LiDAR gives us the ability to obtain a 3D pose of a satellite. You're probably wondering, you got this satellite in space and you're going to grab onto another one, but how do you know how to grab onto it? The LiDAR gives us a 3D image of where everything is. So that was a cool project I worked on. Also a GPS receiver. This is a GPS receiver with the world record for the highest orbiting and fastest orbiting satellite in the world. And uh, it tells you where you are, just like your phone, you have GPS, right? It triangulates your position. And a reaction wheel helps to rotate the spacecraft so we can orient it. And the star trackers tell us exactly where we are. So some I've been blessed to work on some really cool missions. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what your questions are about space. What comes to your mind when you think about space? What questions do you have? What do you think you want to explore? Well, if you're like me, here's some questions I have. I want to know, are we alone in the universe? Yeah. Are there other life forms out there? It can't be that this universe, you know, theoretically started billions of years ago and we're the only ones. Or is time travel possible? I mean, if you if you want to have the ability to go investigate distant stars, distant galaxies, we got to go beyond the speed of sound. We got to go the speed of light. Can we can we get there or can we travel in time? If we can't travel through time, maybe maybe we can travel at the speed of light. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, probably even more a Star Wars fan, but I really love how they took the time to innovate vehicles that could take us anywhere across the world. And my last question is, you know, what happens if we can't live on this earth anymore? Maybe there's an asteroid coming like you see in the movies, or maybe we, we didn't treat our planet as well as we should have. What are we going to do? Are there other planets out there similar in size with a reasonable distance from their own sun that could support oxygen and other things so we can live? Hey, those are the kind of questions I have, and I would love to hear some of the questions you all have. But yeah, this is where we want to go. Let's talk about the past. Like, how did we get here? And then we can talk a little about the present. And then after that, we can talk a little bit more about you all and how you're going to take us to the future. So how did it all start for us? Well, there was a huge race to get into space. And actually the Soviet Union was the first one to get a vehicle into space. That was Sputnik 1. And as soon as they got a vehicle into space, you know, the Americans say, oh, we got to get in the game too. The MA6 space capsule, that's the, from the Mercury program, was able to place the first American in space. And then following that, you know, we had all those different Apollo missions and we're trying to get many humans into space, but we realized we got to get better rockets. If we're going to launch into space, we got to get better rockets. So we started with the Saturn V, which was taking multiple people in the space at a time, a couple a year. But, you know, we realized that to really investigate space, we need to have multiple people going into space at multiple times. So the space shuttle started and the space shuttles were really, really great because they allowed us to have somewhat of a reusable portion of the shuttle itself. But most of the rocket, that was expendable. And the rockets are extremely expensive. So the government's been doing pretty good in space, but the commercial world realized they can get into the game and they can innovate. And you've seen it. SpaceX has done something that is unbelievable. Developed a rocket that not only can launch into space, it actually navigates almost autonomously to land on the ground. And that portion that's land on the ground is reusable. So now we can have reusable shuttles. We can have some, some regards reusable launch vehicles. I mean, we're just kicking butt, but none of this compares to what you all are going to do. Some things that you're going to do like live on Mars. I mean, in your time, it's going to be absolutely unbelievable. So that's my next question for you. What would you want to investigate in space? What are some theories you have? What are some things that you want to find? Would you want to travel into space? Man, all that stuff is just so, so crazy cool. Let's talk about some of the missions and how they're organized. First, space communications, pretty important. Why? Because if we can't communicate with things like the rover on Mars, then we can't reorient it. We can't get images. We can't get video. We can't see what's going on in real, almost in real time. 
So space communication is important. And then we have to navigate, you know, interplanetary navigation. How do we navigate between different satellites? How do we navigate between different planets? How do we navigate from the Earth to the moon, to Mars? All that is extremely important. And Earth and planetary and environmental science. Now, you may be thinking, man, that's a lot, but we have to protect our Earth. We're living here. We're going to be living here for a long time. When hurricanes come around, when when storms come around, we use satellites to help predict what's going to happen so that in the end, people can get out of that area in a reasonable amount of time. All of that comes through that environmental science. Then there's the orbital servicing and assembly. We talked about that. We're going to fix some satellites in space. There's some space weather monitoring. So, you know, the sun puts out those crazy solar spurs that could do some damage to our Earth. So we're always investigating that. And if you're like me and you want to learn about aliens, you want to learn about distant planets, then you are all about astrophysics. So that's the main components of the types of mission that we perform in space. But here's another question for you. What do we send in space? What are all the different types of things that we send in the space and how do we classify them? Yeah, it's payloads that achieve the mission. Payloads are what we send into space and a payload could be almost anything. It could be a satellite. It could be you, the next astronaut. It could be the lunar lander. It could be a rover that's on Mars. Anything that we send into space is a payload. Here's some examples. You ever heard of the James Webb Space Telescope that's just investigating everything that has to do with history of our universe? Astronauts for sure. And this Mars rover, which you talked about, that's a payload. And anything that we send on the moon, that, that's a payload. These payloads have to be designed to survive some very extreme conditions too. We'll talk about that later. But the main thing that we focus on for most of our investigations are satellites. Satellites that may dock with the International Space Station or a satellite that is performing different missions that could be in our future light years away from our Earth. The satellite is what's placed on the rocket that is sent into space to perform these different investigations. OK, so that's so now we got our satellites. We, we understand those. How do we get the payloads in the space? This is big. How do we get the payloads into space? What do we use? Well, if you said rockets, you are correct. It is rockets. That's how we travel into space. And I have a really, really nice video to show you about a rocket that was pivotal in our time. The Apollo 11 launch that launched some of the first people all the way to the moon. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5. Wasn't that video just awesome? I mean, you could see the people's faces. I mean, unlike you, I mean, you've seen SpaceX, you've seen people, you know, multiple times astronauts from different countries in space, but this is the first time in our country, in our world, that we really had seen someone travel to the moon. They were absolutely in awe of this moment. And again, we're going to be in awe of what you all do in your time. I mean, you're going to take it you're going to take space and space travel just to the next level for sure. But first, before we before we go to that next level, how do we get there? Well, first, we have an atmosphere, right? The atmosphere, we got to travel through that before we even get into space. Now, the atmosphere is a lot of, of air and molecules that uh, could cause drag and it, it makes it difficult for us to 
And in addition, with gravity, it makes it difficult for us to get in the space, right? But the atmosphere is important. It's very important. Did you know that it's almost like a blanket covering the earth that keeps us in a reasonable temperature so that we all can survive? Without our atmosphere, with something like the magnetosphere, the solar radiation would hit this earth and we probably wouldn't have life. We think that Mars at some point lost its atmosphere, lost its magnetosphere, and that's why it can't support life. So the atmosphere is extremely important. But yeah, there's a lot of forces that we have to fight in the atmosphere in order to just get into space, right? And then we're, once we're in space, you know, we're not protected by that atmosphere anymore. So your rocket, your satellite has to be designed to survive some extreme temperatures. It has to survive this vacuum in space. Sometimes your satellite will be shadowed or behind the earth. It can't see the sun, so it's extremely cold. Sometimes it'll be right in front of the earth, looking directly at the sun, so it'll be extremely hot. All the electronics, all the structure, it has to survive. And if there's radiation going on, it has to survive electromagnetic interference, all these different things going on. They have to be designed to survive all of that once we're in space. So now we talked about space and what we have to travel through in the atmosphere. What do we use, again, to get into space? Well, that is the rocket, right? And this is what you're going to develop, a rocket. And you've seen that the game here is, you know, satellites get larger and larger. The James Webb Space Telescope spans almost the length of a football field. They're getting larger and larger. So rockets have gotten larger and larger and larger for sure. I mean, we, we got to get more and more stuff in the space. So rockets have just gotten crazy large. Um, they carry the astronauts, they carry the satellites, they carry other things that fix satellites. I mean, we're just all over the place with what we put in the space. But look at the rocket parts. When you look at the rocket parts, I mean, you see the fuel, the frame, the oxidizers, you see the pumps, that's all important, and the fins and the structure. But at the top is the payload. When you look at this, it's very interesting. The payload is only 10% of this entire vehicle. That doesn't seem efficient, does it? It's not. I mean, at this point, this technique of using rockets and the, and the efficiency that they have, we only get a little bit of payload that we can send into space. And we want you to help improve that. And that's why we're giving you a really, really cool project. And maybe we can improve that through our propulsion system. Maybe we can improve that through lightweight new materials. We'll have you think about that when you develop your rocket. But let's talk about propulsion a little bit. There are two different fuels that we use and systems that we use to propel rockets into space. The first one is the solid rocket engine. And the solid rocket engine is almost like your bottle cap. Now, when I was young, me and my brother used to have these little rocket bottle cap things that we would launch at each other. That's dangerous. We probably should have done that. But it's very similar. What you learn is once you launch it and you let it go, it's powerful, it's fast, but there's no control in it. There's no stopping it, right? That's how solid rocket engines work. There's, there's no control in them. Once you launch it, it's gone. Now, versus a liquid rocket engine. Now, a liquid rocket engine is different. You do have some control. You do have some throttle. It's almost you're sitting in your car, you hit the gas, you go you go forward, you want to you give it a little more gas, you go faster, you give it less, you decelerate, right? You let go of the gas, hopefully you slow down and stop. It's very similar with a liquid rocket engine. Maybe not as powerful, but it gives you that control. And we need both options sometimes in within a rocket in order to achieve what we need to achieve. So now you have you understand satellites, you understand spacecraft, which are payloads. Now you understand the launch vehicles, which are the rockets. It's time, finally, for you to develop your own rocket system. And that's your challenge here today. Challenge number one is to develop your own rocket and it's gonna launch a payload in the space. You're gonna build it, you're gonna test it, you're gonna improve it, all that great jazz. We've given you a bunch of different balloons and other things in your kit. And what we want you to do is tape a part of your line or your reel to the ground and then see how much mass and how quickly you can launch that rocket all the way to the silver. That's your goal. Hey, maybe you start with no mass. Start a little easy, right? And then slowly start adding mass until you get to the point where you absolutely can get anything in a space. And maybe you take some of those great ideas you implemented and help folks at NASA and SpaceX develop even better rockets. That would be really, really cool. But what we want you to use for your tool to improve is the engineering design process. Hey, so before we just start throwing those balloons and, and straws and fishing line all together, 
Do a little research on rockets. Do a little research on rocket balloons. What are some of the challenges you have to overcome when you have to develop them? And then make a design. Once you make a design, you draw it all out, you map it all out. Trust me, when it's time to actually build it, you're going to build an even better product. And then after you build, don't be afraid to fail. Test it out. See what, what issues that you have that uh, maybe you got to discard or maybe you need to improve to make the rocket even better. We've given you multiple balloons. We've given you a lot of tape. We've given you a lot of materials. So you can keep doing this over and over and over again. Now, me personally, I have been blessed to obtain a couple patents. Every one of the patents, these innovations that I've obtained have come through my failures, not through anything that was easy. And then after you have something that's great and that's working, now it's time to deploy it. Maybe you all have a rocket competition in your class. I can't wait to see it. But as you're thinking about this, are there already some ideas that you have floating around your mind? How are you going to make this a really, really cool, a really fast, a really powerful rocket? Maybe there are some questions that you have already. You could spend a little time and just start jotting that stuff down now. The more you think about it, the more you research, the more you, you plan, trust, you're going to have a much better product. We also have some ideas and suggestions for you, some ways to kind of get your mind thinking about this rocket. How are you going to attach the straw to the balloons? How are you going to keep them secure? Think about friction. How do we reduce friction? How do we ensure that the rocket, when it's traveling up, stays straight? So if you want it to stay straight and navigate in a way that is straight from the ground to the top, maybe you add some fins to control some of that lateral mo movement, to control some of the spinning. Maybe you added a rocket and you don't think it has enough power to get you all the way to the top. It, it just kind of goes to the middle midway and then it stops. Think about staging. That staging is where you have multiple rockets. The first stage gets you from the ground to some level. Then the next stage is take you even further until you get out of the atmosphere. Maybe you could come up with a cool way to stage. Also, you know, you may think I'm just going to add a bunch of different rockets all at one time and just have full power, full thrust, full throttle until I get into outer space. Hey, any ideas you have, try them out, test them out. As long as you're trying, you're good to go, okay? Here's some other suggestions we have. You know, try to use a clothespin or tape to secure the opening to the balloon, you know, because you want an easy way to keep trying this over and over again. You want to have an easy way to release that pressure from out of the balloon so you can launch effectively. And then we always want you to document your design because in this engineering design process, you may try this 10 times, but maybe you think, man, I need to go back to number three. So as long as you documented that, hey, number three had boom, 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 these different ideas, you go back to it, you improve that one, and that may be the best one. Let me show you some pictures as well. This is a short video that kind of goes through Katie, one of our engineers, building up her rocket. And as you're working through the process, come up with some good techniques to secure the straw. Come up with some good techniques, like we said, to, to hold the end of the balloon closed. Think about maybe using multiple straws in order to secure a very, very large balloon, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can think about solving this problem. Oh man, Katie, you're absolutely killing it. Look at that. And you're also, I'm showing you just an image of how to place this cup onto your rocket balloon. Now this cup is kind of secured directly to a straw. That's an idea I came up with. Hey, you may come up with an even better idea. So if you enjoyed this, we want you to continue to explore rocket and spacecraft organizations. Now the government is a great place for you to explore. It's a great place for you to work. There are a lot of established government agencies from across the world that are involved in space. But there's also commercial entities as well. Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, SpaceX, Boeing, they're all in the space race and they're great places to work. And they're working on innovative products that allow us to do some of the things like develop rockets even better and better than we've ever done before because they're making hundreds of them. So they, are, they have the opportunity to really improve. And it starts really with universities. So we want you right now, if this is what you're thinking of doing, start looking at some universities. Now, I'm pretty biased towards Purdue. I thought that was a great university boiler up, but Stanford has a great program, University of Maryland, and even NASA has some different launch competitions you can get involved with, both from a university and collegiate standpoint, but even while you're in high school right now. 
All right. Hey, we're not done. I got a couple things I want to show you, some other resources, some other activities that I would love for you to see. But as you continue to explore, if you enjoy spacecraft design, if you're interested in propulsion, if you're interested in aerodynamics or fluid mechanics or aircraft design, here are some fields that you should investigate. We talked about aerospace and astronautical engineering. Aerospace is everything in the atmosphere. Astronautical engineering is everything beyond the atmosphere. But and if none of this is possible, none of these vehicles are possible without mechanical engineering, the structure that has to be developed. How do we make sure things don't fatigue or break as we're trying to launch through this crazy gravity and crazy atmosphere in the space? All that's important. Electrical engineering is important. I mean, space vehicles are electrical systems. They have batteries. They have solar panels. They have um, avionics, like a brain that controls everything. And then since we talked about avionics and the brain, computer science, a lot of this stuff has to be automated. So we need software developers and coders to program the spacecraft so the, the Mars rover can perform activities autonomously and not have to wait hours for a signal to come from the Earth. You know, you can see almost every single engineering field can be involved in aerospace. All right. So here's that last mission I wanted to talk to you about. Now, what if you wanted to dock with the International Space Station? Imagine you're an astronaut and you're going to get up there and you're going to be working from astronauts across the world. First, we got to get you there. And that's what we're doing with this challenge number two. We have a spacecraft docking simulation. You're going to automate and control this capsule to navigate its way all the way to the International Space Station. You're going to do this with a very cool game. You're going to use some very cool controls like roll, pitch, and yaw. You're going to change your speeds in different directions. You're going to brake. You're going to you know, navigate through all these uh, different you know, physics so that you can end up having an astronaut that rendezvous onto this capsule. So it actually looks pretty cool. It's like a cool game. You have your controls. It reminds me of a PlayStation 5. And you're really changing that role. You're changing that yard. You're changing that pitch until ultimately you're finally able to get there. Now, it took me about 20 minutes to even get this thing working where, you know, I could navigate very effectively. Hey, but some of you all are gamers. Maybe you'll do it even faster. Well, with that, I want to say thank you all so much. I'm so excited to see what you all would develop. I can't wait to see these launches rocking, these rockets launching, and I can't wait to see you docking in this very, very cool docking game. So your next steps will probably be a Q&A with some of our awesome college students. And then after that, you'll wrap up with maybe an engineer just like me, where we're going to talk about how great you performed in your lab, or we're going to help you improve it real time. So with that, on behalf of Engineering Tomorrow, thank you so much. This was our Space Vehicle Rocket Design Lab. And you all are absolutely going to kill it. Have a good one.